Okay, so we have a lot of people wondering if this monkeypox thing is going to come or go. Is it going to be an ongoing issue that we're going to have to deal with? Are we going to have to sit here and watch the media and the Democrats and all of the mainstream politicians and your leaders and the so-called experts go on to fearmonger monkeypox like they did COVID the past two years? Um, or is it just going to come and go sort of like murder hornets in 2020? You know, is it going to be something that, uh, we forget about in a couple of weeks? I really do hope that it is, but you know, we do kind of have more, I guess, evidence, more indications that this is something that is here to stay for at least a little while. And, uh, it's going to continue to, you know, uh, I guess you could say spread, uh, and I don't necessarily mean monkeypox itself. I actually am more afraid of the fear of monkeypox than monkeypox itself. So um, let's talk a little bit about what the WHO uh, has announced. And then, and then, boys, we're going to talk about what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about how NTI, right? This is a very, very high level globalist uh, group. Uh, they actually conducted a drill uh, back in March 2021, uh, which consisted of an exercise simulating a monkeypox bioterrorism attack. Uh, that's playing out exactly as we're seeing it play out about a year later. Isn't that funny? You know? And, you know, just in my previous video, I talked about how, oh, they just had this perfect little psyop where, uh, you know, a truck crashed in Pennsylvania and there were monkeys on board, lab monkeys, in fact. And then, like, a woman was bit uh, trying to uh, g grab one of the monkeys or something. And uh, the CDC had to respond, the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Yeah, that seemed like a nice little test run to see how people would respond, how scared people would get. At the thought of a monkey-involved virus. Remember Ebola back in 2014, 2015, too? Yeah, all of these things seem to indicate uh, this is something that um, is long ingrained in the psyche of our elites, at the very least. And, and, and something that seemed to, uh, whether it be coincidence or, or just... Uh, just these guys are really just the best experts in the world or they're really lucky you know they seem to run simulations right before something happens like event 201 they simulated a SARS like uh you know respiratory pandemic in October uh 2019 that just so happened to predict COVID two months later yeah all these things um yeah, anyway, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that simulation run by the NTI, the Henry Kissinger-affiliated group. Um, and first, we're going to talk a little bit about this, though. Like, the WHO is convening for an emergency meeting on monkeypox. And so, let's read this. The World Health Organization plans to hold an emergency meeting on Friday to discuss the international transmission of monkeypox. New cases of the viral zoonotic disease, which is rare and typically confined to Central and West Africa, has been detected in Australia, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Sounds like just NATO. Sounds like NATO. You know, I do I do have a strong suspicion they're going to blame this on Russia, especially when this um, NTI run exercise we're about to talk about uh, predicts this monkeypox outbreak as a bioterror attack in their simulation that they ran. Yeah, yeah, it just, you know, I know these people. I know how they operate. And, you know, this this is very indicative of, of, a, of a real serious situation, sort of like we had with COVID. I do think uh, people are a little bit desensitized to the idea of, you know, you, uh, having a virus be a pretext to take away our freedoms, but they're going to try to do it again, uh, or at least they're going to try to just keep exhausting us, you know? Sort of like, I really do like to compare this to past events where there was like mass shootings like every other month under the Obama administration, and then you had all these politicians ever since the Aurora, Aurora shooting, and you could even say it started with the Virginia Tech shooting, and then you had the... Uh, uh, obviously Sandy Hook, and then you had 
uh, just a whole bunch of other shootings under Obama over and over again. The, this these events used as a pretext to take away your Second Amendment, mainly even the First Amendment, and it kind of failed, but it, but it succeeded in many ways. I mean, just look at the state of Connecticut. You can't buy. It's very very difficult to buy guns now after Sandy Hook. So anyway, uh, I digress a bit there. New cases of the disease uh, popped up in all the NATO countries, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I do wonder if they're going to blame Russia. Uh, not all the NATO. These aren't all NATO countries. Many of them are, but I don't know. I don't think Sweden is. But anyway, in the UK alone, the number of confirmed cases more than doubled on Friday to 20, raising fears of the virus uh, spreading uh, undetected through the community. And then uh, the WHO put out a tweet, a long tweet thread here about the whole thing. Uh, monkey pox has been reported in 11 countries, yada, yada, yada. There are about 80 confirmed cases and 50 more pending investigations and more likely to be reported. And again, this is monkey pox. So monkey pox does have a, a death rate of around 10% at its highest and around like 1% at its lowest. So anyways... Uh, these monkeypox cases are from non-endemic countries. WHO continues to receive updates on the status of ongoing outbreaks in endemic countries through established surveillance mechanisms. Oh, yeah, we got those as a result of COVID. And so they're talking about this in the new WHO treaty too. How can they can how they can strengthen these surveillance methods? It, it, what they're doing with these little pandemics that we're all having now, or big pandemics, uh, I I don't know. We'll see how, how much this monkeypox thing pl uh, plays out. But what they're doing now is they're actually consolidating power into a centralized world government system, which was already sort of there in a way, at least the framework for, for, for it was. But now the WHO, with this new treaty they're trying to push, they're meeting from the 22nd of May to the 27th of May, 198 countries, uh, all the leaders um, and experts from every respective country that's part of the UN, basically part of the WHO, are meeting uh, during this time. And the next week... May 22nd to May 28th to, to vote on this new World Health Assembly and, and the treaty, the treaty um, uh, for international health regulations. Uh, if passed, both the treaty and the amendments to the IHR will be legally binding under international law. So this World Health Assembly is happening now, right? You know, they just plan these things really well and they just so happen to have this media event of the monkeypox, big scary monkeypox happening as they, uh, their leaders of every country in the world basically are convening to vote on this. Sounds like, uh, you know, with, with, with monkeypox in the background, it really is going to incentivize these leaders and uh, pressure them to vote Yes, on whatever the globalists want for this um, treaty and uh, the, the, the changes to the uh, interna international health regulations. And what this does is it basically it, it, it puts guidelines in for every nation part of the WHO for them to basically be in lockstep with whatever the WHO says in terms of how they report things, how they respond to pandemics and uh, how they uh, deal with the situation of a global pandemic. You know, instead of a country having its own guidelines, they now have to more so, uh, if this treaty is signed, if these changes to the IHR are put forth and, and basically voted on, yay, then, then these countries will all, all have to act more so in lockstep with the WHO than before. So that's really what's going on here. And... Um, According to the Telegraph, the main topics of conversation at the WHO convened meeting. This is the, this is the meeting on monkeypox. They're still so they're having a meeting on monkeypox this week, and they're voting on this IHR uh, at the at the World Health Assembly. Uh, so so they're they're having two big events this week, and and so this is all with monkeypox in the background, you know. This is all very, very important. Um, 
The main topics of conversation at the WHO convened meeting are expected to include how the virus is being spread, the unusually high prevalence in gay and bisexual men, and and also the vaccination situation. Yeah, that. They're already using and offering the, uh, blah, 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 what do you call it, smallpox vaccine to treat monkeypox in the UK. And they'll be probably offering it everywhere. One potential course of action will be raised uh, well, whether or not the vaccination with smallpox made by Bavarian Nordic known as Genios in the US and Amvenex in the UK should be used for contracts contacts of people known to be infected the vaccine is only approved in the uk for protection against smallpox despite the virus being eliminated since 1980 but but can be used off license to protect against monkeypox data show the vaccine which is uh, the only non-replicating virus in the world for smallpox or monkeypox reduces a person's risk of disease by 85 percent if a person receives the jab within four days of an infection, the vaccine can modify the course of the infection and improve their prognosis. Sound familiar? Sounds like what they're saying the COVID, you know, vaccine can do for you in many ways. What you know, at least similar. You know, of course, talk to your doctor. Listen to what the WHO says. That's what I have to tell you here on YouTube. You know, um, ah, <laughs> so. Yeah, British officials have ordered 20,000 doses of the smallpox vaccine to help protect people who may be exposed to monkeypox. Dr. Anne Ramone, professor of epidemiology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a world-renowned monkeypox expert, told The Telegraph that vaccinating close contacts of the confirmed cases, also known as ring vaccination, is a good starting point. So now, hey, look, now... Sounds like to me, if you've been contact traced as having supposed contact with somebody who supposedly has monkeypox, right? It's like, you know, you're at the grocery store or you were at the airport and you, uh, according to your phone location data, uh, the WHO has um, confirmed or your national health agency, uh, because they have to, you know, be in lockstep with the WHO, they've confirmed um, that you were in close contact with somebody, a stranger you sat next to at the airport, or, you know, you were standing in line behind at the grocery store. Um, and, uh, you know, because of that, you now have to get your smallpox, monkeypox vaccine, uh, as mandated by your, your government officials. So this, this is what I see coming down the road, see coming down the pike. This is the next step in the pandemic um, psychological operation, okay? So let's just put it that way. So, and uh, she goes on to say here, this is Dr. Anne Ramoyne, Dr. Anne Ramoyne here. We do have a vaccine that works, but I doubt that we will need widespread vaccination. But ring vaccination may be a relevant strategy, she said. It was a very relevant strategy for smallpox. It is how we eradicated smallpox. So, yeah. You know, why are we... And I asked this in the previous video. Okay, since, since we eradicated smallpox since 1980, why are they producing millions and millions of monkeypox vaccines it turns out as i talked about in the previous video as well the united states just um up their purchase order of up to 13 million smallpox vaccines uh they have a contract with bavarian nordic yeah so why are we ordering why is the u.s government ordering 13 million smallpox vaccines monkeypox vaccines you know it sounds like this thing they know something we don't know Maybe. I don't know. Uh, Ramoyne, who began studying monkeypox uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2002, said that now, 20 years later, the vast majority of the world has no immunity to pox viruses. Oh, go figure. We lost immunity, I guess, according to her. Oh, I guess we're in trouble. guess we're in trouble. The big issue is now that the world is no longer, by and large, immune to pox viruses. We'll see more cases, she added, as the world becomes more susceptible to pox viruses and we have exposure over time, you know, because of increased travel rate, etc. 
we can expect uh, to see more cases. It is recommended that individuals exhibiting symptoms of monkeypox, which include rashes and fever, seek immediate medical attention and contact clinics before visiting. The WHO says it has been discussing monkeypox with, with experts uh, from affected countries on a daily basis. In addition, health authorities in Australia, Canada, I'm sorry, U.S., whatever, U- Europe, yeah, um, yeah. So the committee uh, is due to meet on Friday, um, and it's the strategic and technology, uh, tech, technical. I cannot talk. Strategic and Technical Advisory Group on Infectious Hazards with Pandemic and Epidemic Potential, which advises WHO on infection risks and could pose a threat to global health, Reuters reported. Uh, The WHO Director General of Health Emergencies um, response said during another meeting earlier this week that the most important thing we can really Uh, The most important thing we really need is to invest in understanding the development of monkeypox because we have so many unknowns in terms of the dynamics of the transmission, the clinical features, and epidemiology. In terms of therapeutics and diagnostics also, we have some important gaps, she added. Hmm, yeah. So... Now, isn't this interesting? This is where we get into the meat and potatoes. This is where we get into the good stuff. The whole point I'm really making this video... The whole point, that was just an update. That was just an update, okay? That's just an update to to, to let you know they're talking about this. WHO is meeting about it. You know, this is no joke. It doesn't look like this is just another murder hornets, right? Remember, I I will never forget murder hornets of 2020. I don't know about you, but that's been on my mind, you know? When I found out about the murder hornets in 2020, I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with forever. The murder hornets are coming. But... After like three days, nobody was talking about the murder hornets anymore. But I didn't forget. I didn't forget. Never forget. You know, you, you know, a lot of people, they say never forget 9-11. I say never forget the murder hornets. So, that being said, <laughs> in March 2021, NTI ran a exercise in collaboration with Munich Security Conference to conduct a tabletop simulation of a global pandemic involving an unusual strain of monkeypox caused by a terrorist attack using a pathogen engineered in a laboratory. Well, what do you know? Hmm. Isn't that something? (sighs) Hmm. Okay. So let's read about this. Let's read about this paper. Okay. So they put out this paper in 2021. Um... So, well, well, first of all, actually, I want to talk a little bit, but before we actually talk about the exercise, let's talk about what NTI is. Just really quick. It's the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, and it's a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization founded in 2001 by former U.S. Senator Sam Nunn and Ted Turner. There are some people who say Ted Turner was the guy who erected the Georgia Guidestones. I don't know. That's just a rumor. It's definitely not confirmed. Of course, on the Georgia Guidestones, it says R.C. Christian. It talks about reducing the population to 500 million, the global population that is, and uh, implementing like an eco-fascist dictatorial world government essentially, you know, and it's like a spiritual like declaration of what they want to bring about. So um, now who else was involved in, in NTI, okay? Uh, George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State. Yeah, anything Henry Kissinger is touching is rotten to the core, okay? Um, so this is uh, Henry Kissinger, bl- brainchild, um, former Senator, obviously, Sam Nunn. And you know, former Secretary of State George Schultz. As well, so you know these are not very friendly people. Okay, these aren't people that have your best interests at heart. I don't care what uh, you know the Washington Post says about people like Wash uh, Henry Kissinger. Not a good guy. Everywhere that guy goes, it reeks of death and destruction and corruption and psychological operations and all of this. So. Um, 
yeah, I wouldn't trust anything that comes out of them. So the nuclear threat initiative. So let's look at the video. Let's look at the video um, that um, that this exercise actually like put out. Right, the, the NTI put this out as as, as like a uh, like a uh, what do you go an addendum to their exercise of what uh, what this monkeypox outbreak was. So let's watch it. This is a fictional scenario. Ah, biological terrorism in one region, unleashed on the rest of the world. Be afraid, be afraid. Billions of cases. Hundreds of millions dead. Hundreds of millions dead. Antiviral drugs and no known effective treatments. Countries around the world are struggling to control another pandemic. And this is interesting. At the bottom, it says, and look, they have, I love how in their like fictional scenario video here, they have instead of CNN, GNN, Global News Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah we know what that means. Or, or, or Gay News Network, maybe. I don't know. Or, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, in the headline, it says, Breaking Monkeypox Engineered to Resist Vaccines. Oh, hmm. I wonder if that's going to come about. Probably not because they want you taking your vaccines, folks. Of course. Poor oversight and gaps in global governance leave us vulnerable to catastrophic biological threats. Of course, what does that mean? What is the solution to this? Of course, well, it's more global governance, right? Right? They seem to be hinting at something here in the exercise itself. It's like they're going to create a problem in their simulation that they already know what the solution is. That's what I don't like about any of this. You know, it's all theater, right? What's the point of having a simulation if you already know what the end goal is going to be? Like if you read the paper here that they put about this whole thing, this NTI exercise, monkeypox exercise, uh, they actually basically say the same things that they said in event 201. It's, it's the same exact thing, right? Uh, we need more global governments. We, uh, you know, we, we need uh, nations to give up their, their sovereignty to the WHO and the UN. And uh, we need to do this so we can work together in a better way and, and surveil people in a better way and steal people's money. We need more funding. We need more of your tax dollars, by the way, as well. So here we go. And, and I already talked about how this just so happens. To, ugh, it just coincides with like Bill Gates trying to promote his new book, How to Stop the, the Next Pandemic. And we need a germ team, you know? He's like pl trying to play his role. We need a germ team, guys. Here's my Dalmatian. Can the international community act quickly enough? The time to prepare for the next global pandemic is now. <laughs> yeah. Learn more at www.nti.org slash bio. There we go. So that's their little video. Let's read the exercise, exercise scenario. Developed in consultation with technical and policy experts, the exercise scenario portrayed a deadly global pandemic involving an unusual strain of monkeypox. That first emerges in fictional the the fictional cut country of Brinia, almost sounds like Britannia, and eventually spreads globally. Later in the exercise, the scenario reveals that the initial outbreak was caused by a terrorist attack using a pathogen engineered in a lab with inadequate biosafety and biosecurity provisions and weak oversight. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? I don't know. It kind of sounds like the, the Wuhan Institute of Technology or the Wuhan Lab or whatever it is. So is that what it is? Wuhan is? No, I'm already forgetting because it's been so long. This is like I remember reporting on like this COVID biolab thing in Wuhan. 
uh, in Wuhan, like in tw- like January 2020. Like, um, anyways. Oh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. I don't know, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Look, so also you had these bio labs in Ukraine uncovered, and a lot of people say that maybe there's this that might play into what's going on with the monkeypox thing. You know, especially. When I see the exercise scenario they came out with in 2021, you know, talking about all of this, I, I feel like it's going to play into the narrative. You know, it just so happens. Like, when's the last time there was a monkeypox outbreak? 2003? And they, they predicted this, like, like what, nine months ago? They ran an exercise. Well, it was actually like a year ago. They ran an exercise about a monkeypox outbreak with the bioterrorism attack. And then we had, yeah, give me a break. Um, the exercise scenario concludes with more than 3 billion cases. That's a lot. Half the world or yeah, like half the world, a third of the world and 270 million fatalities globally. So a 1% or so, wait, no, that's more than 1% actually. Uh, is it, wait, uh, 3 billion, three, yeah, what's that? 10%? Wow. Okay. Close to 10% uh, million fatalities globally as part of the scenario development process. NTI conducted a virtual consultation with experts in December 2020. See Appendix A for the list of participating experts, and we will look at that. So this was, um, so they sort of started planning this, this exercise in December 2020, but they actually conducted the simulation in March 2021. So it was about a year ago or so, maybe a little more than a year now. Um, but um, the exercise was designed for participants to discuss requirements for international architectures related to science-based early assessment of emergency pandemic risks and timely international warnings and alerts for potential pandemics. So uh, discuss how we can force the countries involved in the UN and WHO, how we can force them to scare their population into accepting whatever um, rules that we uh, think are necessary for them and their populations, right? Um, Scare them into, you know, uh, giving up their freedoms, of course, always, closing their businesses, robbing them blind, uh, destroying their economy, um, dividing their population and making them, you know, forcing them into their homes and welding their doors shut, you know? So that's what that's saying, essentially. Um, what's the next bullet point here? Explore conditions that should trigger national pandemic response actions and discuss strategies and challenges for scaling public health interventions. So, uh, you know, exploring the conditions that should um, actually prompt, you know, these, these actions that we take, you know, exploring what conditions are necessary, uh, and discuss, discussing the strategies and challenges for scaling public health interventions. So how can we scale, you know, um, see, uh, our, our power grabs, right? How can we scale this? You know, in the United States, uh, you know, we, we have some states that don't go along with this. How can we scale it so the entire country has to go along with it? Of course, I don't know. I'm so I'm sort of I'm sort of interpreting this maybe a little differently. I don't know. So anyways, uh billet point number three, consider options to reduce biotechnology risks and strengthen oversight um of dual use bioscience research. So how can we um reduce the risks of, I guess, maybe vaccines or something and strengthen the oversight uh, of dual use bioscience research. How can we control the whole output of, of, of the treatments and, and, uh, the, the, the research that goes into it and, um, and the risks involved. I think what they mean by risks here is probably the risk of people finding out that, maybe the people creating this whole thing don't have their best interests at heart. Maybe the pharmaceutical con- companies are corrupt. Maybe, I don't know. And uh, that's a risk, right? So uh, bullet point four, exploring opportunities to strengthen international financing mechanisms to bolster global health security preparedness. So how can we steal your money? How can we get more uh, foreign um, governments to just 
you know, buy off politicians in countries that don't comply. Financing, I get it. Okay. So, um, what's this? So, these are the NTI Munich Security Conference tabletop exercise participants. So, some of these names uh, I've I've heard a couple of times. I'm pretty sure I've heard Beth, Dr. Beth Cameron here and there. So, um, let's look at some of the institutions they're involved with, though. Um, well, you got the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Oh, what do you know? Yeah, the same um, foundation that, of course, funded Event 201 right before COVID, too, along with John Hopkins and World Economic Forum. Mm, go figure. Um... The Welcome Trust. Yeah, we've heard of them. The U.S. National Security Council. What do you know? Ah, Johnson & Johnson, Global Public Health. Ah, yeah, what do you know? Go figure. Uh, Obviously, the U.N. um, That doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, The Chinese CDC. Oh, look at that. Hmm, Yeah, interesting. Funny how that all works. Um, Oh, look, the FDA, former commissioner of the F. DA, what do you know? That's Dr. Margaret Hamburg. Peggy, of course. Uh, look, Peggy in uh, parentheses. Isn't that cute? Oh, look, the head of corporate affairs for Merck, one of the most well-meaning pharmaceutical companies in the world, we all know. Um, and, of course, Sam Nunn, the guy that created basically or helped create uh, NTI. Um yeah, so all these lovely individuals. The discussion was organized into three sequential moves corresponding with scenario developments, followed by a roundtable discussion of broader biosecurity and pandemic preparedness issues. The step-by-step approach to revealing scenario developments reflected the limitations of in- information available to real-world decision makers, as well as the resulting uncertainty associated with a pandemic of unknown origin. So oh, you got all these scenarios. Oh, yeah. How do we do this if, uh, you know, this happens in this way? And the international alert and warning systems. Mm. Um, benefits of predetermined triggers for national response. So, you know, they want to be able to create uh, reactions and, and solutions out of non-threats, essentially, before something even becomes a so-called pandemic so that's sort of uh, the goal here. It's like, how can we figure this out? How can we create a, an apparatus, a, a, a framework, a global framework? And, of course, this is all right before the, the – you know, I feel like the, the, they sort of ran this to figure out what to put in their treaty here. You know, this new uh, international health regulation treaty they're about to sign. It's like, you know, in this treaty, they're trying to figure out how to create a framework to be able to – Take away your freedoms without even a real threat happening, you know, before a pandemic even happens. And, and that's that's sort of what I see here. It's like, you know, wouldn't it be a lot less risky for everybody, you know, especially for the so-called experts, right, who, who constantly get things wrong, get caught with their pants down, get caught being involved in corruption um, and lying to you, right, and then you know, having ulterior motives and all of this. And, you know, the globalist institutions, the politicians, the NGOs, all of these people that uh, are just, they, you know, they're there to create a world government and take away your freedoms, period. That's what it is. And, and rob you blind. You will own nothing and be happy. We all know it. How can we make it so, you know, you know, the leadership of these countries um, don't even have to risk actually dealing with a real crisis, Right, right. Like, how can we make it so it's like, oh, we got this. We're, we're at, you know, what do you call it? Level red. It's a, a code red alert, and now we have to do this, this, and this. But and 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 oh, look, we were able to stop this pandemic. Uh, nothing actually happens, and they still are able to surveil you, take away your freedoms, and, and do all these things like shut down some businesses, maybe, uh, you know, siphon more money, uh, you, vote, vote for you to uh, give up your tax dollars to to the WHO, all of these things. Oh, look, we did this. Oh, look, we can vaccinate some people. There's a threat. There's a threat without there actually being a threat. And then they can claim credit and say, look, because we did all these things, because uh, we exercised our power and we seized control uh, even more and siphoned more of your money uh, and shut down your businesses and disrupted the supply chain, 
uh, we were able to stop this pandemic in no time, right? Anyways, so they go on to, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about the entire, you know, different um, ways this this goes in their simulation because it's kind of boring, right? I mean, the whole, the, the whole, like, point is, and of course, when they run these simulations, you can get a lot out of it. You can get a lot out of it in terms of, like, this is an agenda they're going to play, play out. Monkeypox will be involved. Um, and, you know, using that to consolidate power into a, a globalist apparatus and framework will be involved, but the specifics of it are never exactly as they, uh, play it out in their simulations a few months before or a year before or whatever it is. Because if you look at event 201, it's a good framework of what we have because, you know, it was a SARS pathogen, a uh, respiratory virus that spread around the world. And it's very similar. Like they figured out how to deal with it. They figured out like what are the problems that will arise and how can we deal with that? And, um, you know, how can we, we can seize control? What will people's reaction be? What will be the media's reaction be? Uh, what are, you know, some of the uh, adaptations we might have to make uh, and, and stuff like that to be able to bring about their agenda in a better way. It's like a, uh, this this is a war, right? So if you're preparing for a war, if you're practicing what, you know, like flight simulator and stuff, a battle simulator, you know, like um, I'm sure I'm not a, uh, a fighter, an air fighter, whatever, um, fighter jet. I don't fly a fighter jet for the Air Force, but I'm guessing they probably engage in all sorts of, uh, drills, you know, to, you know, how do you deal with this scenario? And, you know, they have like, a, um, um, like a whole narrative, of like, you know, we got this going on, you, you have this mission and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, this happens. So how do you deal with that? And you got to do a flight simulation of how you would deal with that. Or you might actually be in the field and do like a dry dress rehearsal, whatever of, of how you would deal with that with like, not, you know, real like guns or anything, but like, um, you know, all simulated in, in, in a, an electronic way for to practice for the real world for when you go to war, right? And that's sort of what this is because this is a war on the public. This is a war on humanity. Do you understand that? And so, the, you know, these things are, are practice runs, test runs for what they're going to uh, bring about in a problem reaction solution type way to consolidate the world into a globalized structure of control. And that's what this is about. It's Satan's plan. Okay. This is a spiritual battle. Okay. And this is just, this is the groundwork. These are the, the, the okay. This is like, this is a very, uh, what do you call it? Worldly manifestation of it. And I like to cover that because it's just what I'm good at. And, and so this is what I'm talking about here. So really kind of interesting stuff. Um, now I'm going to leave links for all this so you can see it for yourself because it is kind of hard to believe, you know, I, Andrew, I get it. I get it. So, um, and then also, so these are some of the report findings and recommendations, of course. And what do they say? Of course, they say the same things that they're saying for the WHO treaty and renegotiation, right? Um, of course, they found, and the key findings of this simulation were that we have weak global detection, assessment, and warning of pandemic risks, right? We have gaps in our national level preparedness. National government should improve preparedness by developing, developing national level pandemic response plans built on a coherent system of triggers that prompt anticipate anticipatory action despite uncertainty and near-term costs. In other words, a no regrets basis. Exactly what I said before. Exactly what I said before. The whole idea of like not it, like them being able to use a pre, this as a pretext, even though there isn't a real outbreak of anything yet, to take action despite the uncertainty and near-term costs. Right, that that's what th this means. Despite the fact that oh, you, we we just bankrupted half the country because we thought there would be a pandemic, because we decided it's code red, high risk, right? So, in other words, a no regrets basis. This is straight from NTI.org. This is what they want. They want to be able to utilize 
fake threats. Because COVID kind of crumbled. I mean, it really worked super well at first. But people just got kind of tired of it. And now it's kind of like, well, it, I guess it depends where you are. Because if you're in Australia or Canada or China, they're still crushing. But in some countries, it kind of crumbled. England and the U.S., I don't know. Things are pretty, I mean, besides the economy and like the fact that everything's destroyed now. Now we have a lot of problems. But it's not like, you know, there's no mask mandates and stuff. Uh, you know, vax mandates kind of fell apart. Vax passports kind of fell apart. But of course, a 10% kill rate monkeypox, if this really, really happens, like big time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's coming back. All this is probably coming back. So, I, you know, I'm speaking too soon probably. But again, you know, I think a lot of what their agenda is is to make it so they can, like I said before, sort of take action and implement uh, draconian policies without a real threat. Gaps in biological research governance. Uh, the international si system for governing dual-use biological research is e neither prepared to meet today's security requirements nor is it ready for significantly expanded challenges in the future. There are risk reduction needs throughout the bioscience research and uh, development life cycle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I said before, inf insufficient financing of international preparedness. They want to steal your money. Yeah, we get it. Um, uh, and here's the recommendations to deal with this. Bolster international systems for pandemic risks assessment, warning, and investigating outbreak origins. Exactly what Bill Gates wants with his germ team. You know, full-time staff of people who just LARP is like, you know, um, scientists or whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, the United Nations system would establish a new mechanism for investigating high consequence biological events of unknown origin, which we refer to as joint assessment mechanism development and institution institute national level triggers for early proactive pandemic response. Yeah. Like I said, the no regrets approach. To facilitate uh, anticipatory action in a no regrets basis, national governments should develop a national level plan to, that define um, the, and incorporate triggers for responding to high co consequence biological events before they even happen, essentially, right? Um, establish an international entity dedicated to reducing emerging biological risks associated with rapid technology advancements. Um, dedicated to reducing the risk of catastrophic events due to accidental misuse or deliberate abuse of bioscience and biotechnology. Yeah, well, that sounds like, okay, um, well, then maybe you should uh, develop an agency that uh, regulates and monitors Pfizer and, um, and Merck and, you know, uh, Johnson and Johnson and Moderna. Maybe you should do that. Of course, they're not going to do that. No, no, no. This is to, uh, supposedly, you know, um, uh, you know, regulate more th these bio labs and stuff more. Maybe, I don't know, uh, to meaningfully reduce risk. Uh, the entity should support intervention throughout the bioscience and biotechnology research development life cycle from funding through execution and onto publication and commercialization, develop a cyclical global health security fund to accelerate pandemic preparedness capacity building in countries around the world, national leaders, development banks, philanthropic, uh, oh my goodness, philanthropic donors and the private sector should establish and resource a new financing mechanism to boister global health security and pandemic preparedness. Yeah, uh, establish a robust, uh, a robust international process to tackle and challenge of supply chain resilience. Yeah, we could use some of that. Except, of course, you can't trust these people, so maybe not. So anyways, that's what we got. Thanks, NTI. Isn't that funny how that all pans out? So this is an emerging issue. I will continue to cover it. Let me know what you think. Like, share, and subscribe. Uh, follow me on Gab and Twitter. 
Subscribe on BitChute, Odyssey, and Rumble. Also, if you want to contribute to the channel, contribute to my work, I have a Patreon in the description box below. Any amount helps. It's been press. Keep your head up, stay real, and no fear.